Hello and welcome to the second lecture on the introduction to nuclear engineering. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the structure of atoms and um, and sort of their what what they're like inside. So um, as you may be familiar with, most atoms um, have an electron potential cloud, right? So out here, oops, uh, there is an electron cloud, E minus. Um, but inside, the nucleus is actually a cloud of neutrons and protons itself. So it's a potential cloud. Um, and so you can think of an atom as being these doubly nested clouds. So one for the electrons, and then the other for the neutrons and protons that form the nucleus. Um, and the neutrons are in a potential themselves, the, the protons are in a potential themselves, and then the nucleons, the neutrons and protons together, are in another potential uh, as well. Um, and so, interestingly, if we want to talk about the size of the, this domain, um, the size of the nucleus, so our nucleus, or our nu uh, yeah, nucleus, um, can be approximated as five fourths the atomic mass a to the one third power um, in femtometers. So a femtometer, for those of you who may not recall, is uh, 10 to the negative 15 meters, which is pretty tiny. Um, the Radius of an atom, on the other hand, so where the electron, the which is basically the radius of that electron cloud, so that is, depending on the atom, approximately 0 0.5 to up to about uh, 2.5 um, angstroms which an angstrom is, uh, as you may recall from chemistry, 10 to the negative 10 uh, meters itself. Okay? Um, so atoms are mostly empty, right? Uh, there's a lot of space um, in between where the electrons live and where the neutrons and protons in the nucleus are. Um, and electrons are very very small so they don't take up a lot of volume in particular uh, the best measurements to date for electrons are that the radius of an electron is um, I can do that better is less than or equal to um, about 10 to the negative 22 uh, meters right so this is again a factor of 10 million smaller than the radius of the nucleus. And this has an error on it that's plus or minus 10 to the negative 31 meters. So we're very confident that electrons are very, very small. Um, and in fact, electrons are also, uh, interestingly enough, the most spherical objects known in existence. So we have these tiny, there are these tiny little spheres. They're almost perfectly sphere spherical to the best of our ability to measure them. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's move on now. Um, and I'm gonna start by saying that nuclear power is a direct result of converting mass into energy. So the mass in the nucleus is in some way converted into energy that then we harvest to do things like turn turbines and generate electricity. Um, and so just let's say in a reference frame with no, uh, no relative motion, um, the uh, energy at rest of an object at rest um, is equal to, since there's only rest energy, it's equal to the rest mass, m naught, c times the speed of light squared. So that is the rest mass um, 
Um, and sometimes we give this the special variable u to represent a potential energy. Okay. Um, however, if we want um, our something to be moving relative to um, uh, an observer, so we'll define a term called gamma. So this is the gamma defines the relative speed between um, a moving object and an observer. So gamma is equal to one over the square root of one minus the velocity squared over the speed of light squared. Okay. Um, so or so yeah. For oops. For v equal to the magnitude of the velocity vector in meters per second and c equal to the speed of light in a vacuum. Light in a vacuum. And uh, gamma itself is called the Lorentz factor. Okay. All right, so um, this is a useful quantity to know about because um, uh, the relative mass the observer sees uh, is in fact um, m, so the relative mass the observer sees is the rest mass m naught multiplied by gamma, okay? Um, and the energy <laughs> that the observer sees. Um, so the energy in the system between two observers is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared, um, which is equal, as we said before, to gamma times the rest mass times the speed of light squared. Um, and we'll call this, we'll give this the symbol uh, capital T, or given that it's a kinetic energy, okay? Or so that sorry, that's the that's the total total energy. No, that's why it gets a T. <laughs> uh, getting ahead of myself here. So given these things, um, uh, we'll define the total energy is equal to the kinetic energy uh, plus the potential that we defined before. Or to say this another way, the kinetic energy is equal to the total minus the potential. Um, and so uh, the kinetic energy, or the total kinetic energy, which sometimes we just uh, ascribe the letter E to, um, equals K. So this is equal to gamma times the rest mass m naught times the speed of light squared minus the rest mass times the speed of light squared. Um, so of course this equals to, this is equal to um, uh, m naught uh, times c squared times gamma minus one, which since it's a kinetic energy, um, uh, in non-relative cases, right? Uh, so in non-relative cases, this is approximately equal to one half m naught uh, times the velocity squared. Um, so I'll say non-rel. Oops, I've gone over my face here. Um, that's exciting. <laughs> Oops. So there you can see, uh, you can see that there. 
just very briefly. <laughs> um, so, um, sorry about that, still getting used to the system. Um, so, uh, but of course, that only uh, works for things that have mass, and not everything has mass. So for protons, in, or sorry, not for protons, for photons in particular, uh, for, I'll say, photons, which from the last lecture we know have no mass, um, uh, the energy is instead equal to h times nu, where h is a Planck's constant. So h is defined as a Planck's constant, which you can look up. It's in the book. And this has units of joules per second. Um, and uh, the Greek letter nu, sorry, I did a funky version there, um, is the frequency of the photon. And frequencies, of course, have units of one over a second. Okay, that's some um, basic uh, ways to compute uh, energy in relative and non-relative. Uh, in relative systems. So we, since we're talking about converting mass into energy, we're necessarily in this system where we have to be worrying about rest masses and things like that. Okay, so um, it's important to note that everything has a wavelength. So as everything has wavelength give it some exclamation points um, and so we denote wavelengths with the Greek letter lambda so lambda is equal to Planck's constant H divided by the momentum P and this has units of centimeters or meters uh, typically so again, we have, we'll say that P um, is equal to the magnitude of the momentum vector, which um, is equal to the mass times the velocity. And if we're gonna be caring about uh, relativistic systems, um, this is gamma times the rest mass times the velocity, okay? Okay, sorry for the technical difficulty there. Um, so everything has a wavelength and the momentum is equal to gamma m naught uh, v. Um, but given what we know as well, um, we also know that the energy is equal to the momentum times the speed of light in general. Or said another way, the momentum is equal to the energy divided by the speed of light in a vacuum. And thus, our wavelength can be calculated as Planck's constant times uh, the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the energy of, uh, that, pho uh, of that object. And that holds uh, for photons as well. So um, also true for photons. OK. Um, all right, so skipping, moving on to a slightly different topic. Um, electrons orbiting in an atom have various energy levels, right? And so we tend to think these of these as a uh, transition state. So if we have some energy uh, that we'll call zero, right? So this is the default or, or the ground, it's the lowest energy state. Um, so this is, uh, imagine electrons in an atom, then uh, we might get up to a first excited state um, after with some quantum of energy, first excited. 
and uh, let me put e minus here. Then we'll get second excited, third excited, fourth excited. And the energy levels get closer together the more excited states that you have. And this is measured in uh, energy units of electron volts. Um, so transitioning uh, up the <laughs> Uh, requires energy, right? So if you want to go to a higher excited state, um, requires uh, adding energy uh, and then transitioning down will release energy, um, usually in the form of a photon. And so when photons come from the uh, from the electrons transitioning in their orbitals, that's no what's known as an X-ray. So these kinds of transitions are known as X-rays. Um, however, something very similar happens to the nucleons in the nucleus. So um, there is a zero ground energy state for the nucleus, um, right? It's just a potential. Um, there's a first excited, um, uh, second excited, third, fourth, etc., all the way up into uh, when the nucleon is no longer in the nucleus anymore, um, and, or in a continuum. So um, these, however, these excited states are typically measured in MeVs. Um, so the transitions that we see inside of the nucleus you know, it, it's the same idea. Going up to an excited state requires energy, and uh, coming out releases, or going down releases energy in the form of various photons and leptons and baryons that we talked about. Um, but the energies are about, on you know, it, characteristically about a million times larger. Um, and when, when a specific, in particular, when we see photons that transition. Um, there that come out of a nuclear transition these are called gamma rays so they're not x-rays um, but they are instead called gamma rays the only thing different really is where where they were born and their their characteristic energy levels okay um, so additionally um, uh, internal conversion is another is a similar pro is a different process by which photons are released. So this is when an excited nucleus um, ejects a tightly bound electron from an atom um, and places the nucleus itself in a lower energy state. Um, okay, so here's an example of what happened. So here, let's say we've got a nucleus. Um, that uh, is very dense, of course. Uh, and then we've got electrons orbiting um, in their orbital shells. Um, you know, let's just put some of these around the edge. Bam, bam, uh, etc. Okay, so. Uh, what happens in internal conversion is the an electron gets um, uh, <laughs> comes out of the the uh, comes out of the nucleus or sorry uh, or an excited nucleus ejects enough energy to displace an electron that may have been sitting here all the way out of the atom. So there's so much energy um, that one of these tightly bound nuclei, or sorry, one of, excuse me, one of these tightly bound electrons inside in the inner part uh, of the uh, orbital um, is removed from the atom completely and it, it's, it goes away. Um, so what happens then is um, if we go to the next page here, um, we have an our atom or our nucleus, um, and we've got 
a hole that is created by the absence of the electron there. Um, and we've got electrons at higher energy states surrounding uh, in the outer orbitals. And so one of these electrons will fall into that hole and when it does it releases um, a photon. Uh, so we'll be using the symbol gamma to represent photons uh, uh, and squiggly lines to represent photons uh, uh, as well but because this comes from an orbital transition this is actually an this gamma is an x-ray okay um, and specifically so to, to title this so this um, so the electron that is ejected in this way is called an OJ electron. So um, that's the one that gets removed. Oops. <laughs> uh, where? Sorry. So OJ electrons. And it's removed in uh, the process that's called oops, internal conversion. Okay. All right. So that's about all that we'll have for this lecture today. Um, and uh, I will see you again next time. Bye-bye.